I'm so thankful to be here this morning. Um, I just want to share with you, the Lord has really, He's really been doing some wonderful things in my heart and in my life. I'm so thankful uh, for His presence, yeah. for the moving and operation of His Spirit. Um, and, and towards the end of the service, I'll, I'll share with you some of the past of my relationship with the Lord. But what He's been doing lately has just been so special. And I'm so excited about it. I've I'm, I'm just been so uh, sensitive in saying, Lord, please don't allow me to quench your spirit, Lord. I, I don't want to do anything, Lord, that would stop your, your, your Holy Spirit from moving and operating in my heart and, and in my life, causing me to sense in your presence and know that you're there. I know that the Lord says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. If we continue to walk in the faith, if we continue Amen. to put our hope in who Christ is and what he did at Calvary's cross, understanding that it's that and that alone that allows us access into God's presence, that it's that and that alone that allows God access into our hearts and into our lives. Amen. That he'll continue to be with us. But you know what? The truth of the matter is a lot of times we can walk along in our relationship with the Lord and never, ever sense his presence, Amen. never knowing Amen. that he's there and only being able to hold on to the scripture that, Lord, I know you haven't left me or forsake, forsaken me. But I want to tell you today, I don't believe that that's the way that the Lord wants it to be. Amen. I don't believe that that's the way that he intends it to be. The Lord is a living. Listen, he's a holy living God. Amen. He's a moving God. I, I said last week, I believe it was, I preached a message at, at the other church, at our church, and, and one thing I felt like the Lord laid on my heart is that God is on the move. He's moving, amen. And if you sit here today and you're the same place that you was two years ago or four years ago or, or six years ago, then there's a problem in your relationship with the Lord because God is moving. He's ever moving. He's constantly moving and he wants to move in you. He wants to move in your heart. He wants to do a work inside of you. He's a living God. Amen. God's not dead. Amen. Like that movie, God's not dead. He's alive. Amen. He's a living God. I want to ask you this morning, is he alive in you? Yes. Is he moving and operating inside of your heart? Is he causing you to feel the things that he feels? Is he causing you to desire the things that he desires? Is he causing you to love like he loves? Listen, not like the world loves. Not even like Christians love. But I'm talking about like he loves. There's a big difference. Amen. Oh, God's love is different, church. God's love is different. And, I, and, and as a few weeks ago, I, I've really been preaching some, some tough, hard messages that the Lord has been laying on my heart. And when Matt talked to me about coming over here, I said, I got it, Lord. I'm going to go over there with guns blazing. <laughs> I thought I had the message. I thought I had it. I began to just ask the Lord continually, the Lord, have your way, Lord. And over the last week, that message has faded away, and I felt like the Lord has really been placing love upon my heart. And I wasn't sure, I really wasn't sure, and I was just asking the Lord and asking the Lord, and He, he, he kept just placing love, His love upon my heart. And I finally said, okay, Lord, I believe this is what you have for your body here today. And I, I really believe that I have uh, been able to hear from the Lord on this. And I really believe that the Lord wants to bring to remembrance in your hearts and in your lives his love. His love. His love for you. But listen, also you've got to understand his love for your brothers and sisters. See, there's something that's missing in the body of Christ. There's something that's missing in most churches, in most people's lives, and it's the true love of God. Listen, it's one thing to know how the Bible says we're supposed to act and how the Bible says that we're supposed to be. It's one thing to know how Christianity looks, but it's a whole different thing, church, to have Christianity, true biblical Christianity, being alive inside of you. Yes. Yes. Moving. And breathing. And having its way. Had the Holy Spirit having his way inside of your heart. And inside of your life. To the point that you begin to come to, come to a place to where it's no longer about you. Amen. To where it's no longer about you. But it's about those that sit beside you. Yeah. 
It's about those that, that you call brother and sister. It's about those that are lost. I'm here to tell you today that the Lord has begun to, to deal with me in, over these last few months about his body and about the love for his body and the love for his people, but also the love that he has for the lost. Yeah. He's really been dealing with me, Sister Bridget, about how I have spent the last several years holed up inside of a church. Held up inside of a church acting like this is Christianity. Just this. <coughs> but where is it outside? <coughs> What's going on outside of these doors? What's happening when you walk out of this place? What's taking place in your heart and in your life? What's taking place? Is God moving in you? And is he moving through you? Now let me lay a foundation real quick. I believe uh, that you guys have all probably been taught and preached the message of the cross over and over and over again. I hope that is the case, but I just want to, before I go any further, cause you to understand, cause you to look back to everything that I'm going to deal with today, everything that I'm going to talk about today is not something that you can produce in and, in and of yourself. You cannot produce what you need inside of your heart. You cannot make it happen. You cannot uh, pray it up. You cannot conjure it up. You cannot do enough works to cause the Holy Spirit to move and operate in your life. All you can do as an individual is come to a place to where you in your heart, in your mind, and in your soul have come into submission to who Christ is and what he did at Calvary. Constantly, always looking to that. It's, listen, church, it's a battle. The enemy's constantly going to battle you to cause you to move your faith away from who Christ is and what Christ did at Calvary as your provision. But I'm here to tell you that as long as you'll continue to look to the cross, that you'll continue to look to the blood and come, to sur come into surrender at Calvary, that the Lord will be allowed to move and operate Amen. in your heart Amen. and in your life. But I want to continue to go on with that, that you're going to have to come to a place to where you're willing to surrender to the Lord. To where you're willing to surrender and allow him to do inside of you what it is he wants to do inside of you. Let's go to the book of John, chapter 15, real quick. You know, the Lord saved me out of bondage. Just the, the bondage of sin, moral degradation, sexual immorality. Drugs, alcohol, and many of you also, the same things that I've just said have been caught up in the same things. And these things, they I've never never went to actual prison like, like Robert, you know, going to prison or something like that. But I found out what it was to be in prison as a free man. I found out what it was to be in prison and in bondage to sin and darkness. I found out what it was to at one time do things that I enjoyed, but then to wake up one day and see those things that I used to enjoy, they, they owned me. No longer did I enjoy them, but I had to chase after them to get the feelings that they gave me. They owned me. And I would go, I, listen, I would, I'd drive for hours if I had to, to get what I needed. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Whatever it may be, drugs, another person, whatever it was. I'd get off of work and drive till midnight if I needed to, just to get it. And then turn around and come back to work at, at 6 o'clock in the morning. Just so I could get what I want. I've been praying lately and I've been saying, Lord, let me desire you like I desire those things. Let me be willing to chase after you like I chased after those other things. Amen. See, because some of us in here today, we would spend all day looking for a hit or looking for something. But man, if the preacher preaches over 45 minutes, we're going to get upset. <laughs> if worship goes past four or five songs, we're going to have a problem. We're ready to sit down. So as I get into this message this morning, I ask you to examine yourselves. Examine your heart. Examine your relationship with the Lord. And ask yourself, Lord, are you doing in me what your word says that you want to do in me? Lord, are you having your way 
in my heart and in my life. You see, that's something that I had to come to a place to do. And I'll get into that later. The book of John, chapter 15, verse 1, in a message simply titled Love. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me. That word simply means remain. And I am you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it remain in the vine, no more can you except you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that re remaineth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man remain not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue you in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall remain in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Let me read that again. Jesus said, this is my commandment. He didn't, he didn't say this is something that I'm asking you to do. This is something that if you find time in your life and it becomes convenient to you, that I would that you would do this. But the Lord Jesus Christ said, this is my commandment. That you love one another. As I have loved you. Amen. Greater love hath no man. Listen to this church. Greater love hath no man than this. That a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, once again, love one another. Love one another. Jesus said, this is what I command you to do, to, to love one another. But listen, don't love one another the way that you think that you should love one another. Don't love one another the way that the world loves their own. He said, but you are to love one another as I have also loved you. As I have loved you, my commandment is to you is that you love one another the same way, in the same fashion, in the same form. I want to ask you today, is that happening in your heart and in your life? Is that taking place in your heart and in your life? Is the Spirit of God having that kind of freedom in your heart and in your life? What kind of love is it that God wants us to have inside of our hearts and inside of our lives? What kind of love is it? Well, let's talk about that for a little bit. Let's go back up. I'll start in verse 12. He said, this is my commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this. That a man lay down his life. For his friends. I remember reading in the gospels when Jesus would find himself in the garden of Gethsemane. As he was crying out to the father. The word of God says that. Great drops of blood fell from his body. Great, he sweated out great drops of blood under the pressure of what it was the Father had called him to do, of the job, the work that the Father had called him into. 
facing Calvary, knowing full and well what was going to happen to him. Listen, this is the Son of God, the living Word. The Word of God tells us that he was in the beginning with God. That he became flesh and dwelt among men. He knew all things. He says it himself, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He knew in eternity's past that one day he would come down to this earth and he would give his human life, his flesh, as a sacrifice. And as he was in that garden in Gethsemane, I would imagine that probably the very words of, of Isaiah would, would go across his mind as Isaiah would prophesy about the things that would happen to him, how he would not even look like a man when they were done with him, how he would not even be recognizable as a man. And in human form, he found himself in that garden that day, pouring great drops of blood from his pores under the pressure of what he was facing. And he would cry out to the Father and say, Father, if this cup can pass, if there be any other way, Lord, that this can take place, if there be any other way that this can be done, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, Father, your will, not mine. Nevertheless, Father, this is about your will. This is not about me. This is about what you desire to do, Father. Not about what my flesh wants and desires. That's the kind of love, church, that he's called you and I into. A love that is selfless. A love that loses concern over oneself. A love that's willing to, wet, to lay one's own life and one's own reputation down. Are you experiencing that kind of love? Have you been willing to lay down your reputation? Have you been willing to lay down your life for the betterment of your brothers and sisters? Have you been willing to lay down what you think and feel for the lost? Listen, he said, love one another like I love you. Is this happening inside of you? I'm Listen, I got to tell you, I don't want to leave you by yourself because I'm not there yet. But it has become my desire. I can look you in the face today and tell you with all honesty as the Lord looks into my heart that he has placed that desire in me. I don't have a desire for a raise. As a matter of fact, I'm trying to figure out, Lord, how can I quit the job I got? I don't have enough time with you, Lord. I don't have enough time for you, Lord. There's more that's got to be done. There's people out there that are dying, Lord. They're going to hell. I've got to reach them, Lord. I've got, I've got, I know you've called me to this, Lord. I've got to tell them. I've got to let them know. I'm too caught up in this world. I'm too caught up in the things of this life. I've allowed the, the things of this world, the desires of my own flesh to, to creep in, Lord, and to steal my heart from you. To steal me from you, Lord. And I've made excuse after excuse after excuse on why I don't have to love like you love. I'm talking about what's going on in my heart. In my life over the last several years of my walk with the Lord. Being brought to a place of desperation. As I began to realize and see that, Lord, something's not right. Lord, something's not right here. I don't have the relationship with you, Lord, like I once had. I, I made excuses. I said I was dry. Oh, I'm just in a dry place. Listen, I believe there comes a, a, a season of dryness. But I had to come to a place where I realized I was backslidden. Lord, I'm not in a place of dryness. I'm backslidden. I'm far from you, Lord. Just like Jesus told the Pharisees and Sadducees. Repeating the scripture from the Old Testament. Lord, my, my, I'm worshiping you with my lips, but my heart. It's not where it should be. It's not a worship that comes down from deep on the inside. 
Sometimes I stand here, Lord, and I can't wait till the music stops because my feet hurt. That's not right, Lord. Oh, Lord, I remember when I used to worship you in spirit and in truth. When I would cry out to you, Lord, when our, your spirit would fill me from the inside and cause me to, to praise you and to desire you and to long after you and to love your people, Lord. The same way that you've loved me, Lord. I got to a place, and I'm, I'm getting way ahead of myself. I wasn't going to share this till the end. But I got to a place, I had been pastoring a church, the Crossway Ministry of Foos. Some of you know, some of you don't. In Valentine, we had it. Well, we actually moved three times. But I had come to a place, oh, I was miserable. Well, God, I was miserable. Get up, Sunday morning. Somebody had to be there to preach. I didn't want to be there a lot of times. My heart far from the Lord. Not wanting to do this that I have set out to do for the Lord. The bondage of sin creeping back into my life. The things of this world causing me to lose focus and to lose desire. Choking out the word of God that had once burned so bright in my heart and in my life. Trying to play it off as a dry season. But finally coming to it. But listen, listen, I want to encourage you because the whole time. The enemy tried to pull me away from who Christ is and what he did at the cross. I would try to blame it on that. Well, it's just this faith in, in the cross thing. That's why I'm all messed up. But I kept going back to the word of God. And I would say, no, this is God's word. The just shall live by faith. Faith in who Christ is and what he did that will give me what I have need of. Finally, I got to a place where I began to cry out, Sister Bridget. And to say, Lord, I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to walk this way, Lord. I don't want to live without your presence in my heart and in my life. Because, Lord, when your presence is not here, when I'm not in proper relationship with you, Lord, I'm lost and I'm undone and I'll be right back in the same mess that you pulled me out of. Lord, you got to do something. You got to show up. You've got to feel me, Lord. I can't walk without you. I can't even serve you, Lord, if you don't inside of me cause me to. I can't do anything without you, Lord. I need you. I need your presence. I need your love. I need your spirit inside of me moving. Brought me to a place to where I began to question what I was even doing and I asked the Lord for a specific sign about closing down the church that I had started. And a week later, he gave me the specific sign that I asked him for. I said, okay, Lord, it's done. Shut it down. We joined up with another church in Montague. And from that day forward, I began to see the Lord slowly beginning to renew a fire inside of me to the point to where it's gotten to where I feel like Jeremiah. Like there's a fire shut up in my bones. Like, like I just can't not speak about it. I'm so sick. And, I've gotten to the place, brother, to where I began to hate my own life. What do you mean, preacher? I'm talking about I see my life as a hindrance. As something that's an obstruction between me and my God. Something that's taken away from what he's called me to. Which is a living, moving, breathing relationship with him. I've seen a love that's begin to build on, in, on the inside of me. A love for the lost. A love for the body. A desire that people would be set free from the bondage of sin. That homosexuals would be set free. That lesbians would be set free. That crackheads and alcoholics would be set free. Yeah. That prostitutes would be set free. Yeah. A desire to go out and preach this gospel to the homeless. 
But I'm praying, Lord, Lord, don't let them just hear my words. Let your love come off of my lips and penetrate their heart. That they would know that you've touched me. That they would know that you love them, Lord. That they would know that you've shown up. And that you desire to have them. My prayer on the way over here is, Lord, move upon their hearts. Move upon their hearts, Lord. Touch them, Lord. Let them know that you desire them. That you desire to have them. That you desire complete control over their hearts and over their lives. How much of you does he have today? The sister sang a song earlier. I believe it went like this. It said that, Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Listen to this. I live for you and you alone. And we all stood here and saying that. But I want to ask you today, how many of you was it real? Was it just coming off your lips? Or was it coming from deep down on the inside? Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Lord, I live for you. And you alone, you alone, Lord, is all I live for. Is that happening in your heart and in your life? Don't get me wrong, church. I'm not asking you, are you perfect? Because I'm a wretched mess. Nobody's perfect. I'm a wretched mess, church. Except the Lord would do something inside of me each and every moment of, of the day. Every second that I'm awake. If the Lord's not moving and operating in my heart, brother, I might as well throw it in. I know me. 37 years I've walked around dealing with this person. I know the wretchedness that lies deep down on the inside of me. The weakness, the failure, the foolishness, the stupidity that's in here. It's those very things and the recognition of those things that caused me to bow before him in the first place. Understanding, seeing what I am. Not what everybody else is, but what, what I am. Spent so many years blaming my life on things that happened to me. Blaming what I was on circumstances and things that happened to me. Beginning to listen to the world on why I was the way I was. Till finally one day, I got to a place, oh, I remember like it was yesterday. Well, finally I got to a place and it was just me. I said, Lord, it's not everybody else. It's me, Lord. I'm the one. I'm the one that's all messed up, Lord. I'm sick. I've got an issue, Lord. I've got problems. If you don't do something, Lord, I, I don't even want to live with me anymore. On the brink of suicide, on the brink of ending it all. Lord, I don't even want to be here. I'm tired of what I am. And it was there that the Holy Spirit showed up. It was there in that place that the Lord showed up. And it's the same place that I found myself in just some several months ago. Lord, I'm the one. I'm a mess. Once again, Lord, my heart is far from you. And if you don't do something, Lord, if you won't do something in me, Lord, I'm, I'm done. I can't live like this. Will you have your way? I'm going to ask you this morning, and I'm going to continue to ask you throughout this because I want you to examine your heart this morning. I want you to, not your neighbor or anyone else, but you, between you and your God. Listen, if you're born again today, he's your God. If his spirit has entered into your heart and into your life, he's your God today. He's a holy God, like we say. He's a righteous God. He's a God that loved you so much that he sent his only begotten son 
to shed his blood for you. I ask you today, excuse me, examine your heart. I want to go shortly to the book of Galatians, but I want to read to you this definition because there's a lot of preaching on love in the church today. There's a lot of love out there, and I think I've made my point already on the love that I'm talking about. Amen. I'm not talking about a sugar-coated love. I'm not talking about a lie of love. You see, because a lot of the love that's preached in church today is a self-preserving love. It's about preserving my reputation. It's about preserving myself and what people think about me. It's about preserving my life. It's a lie. It's not the love of God. It's a self-preservation love. God's love was a, 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 a love of sacrifice. God's love is, church, a love of sacrifice. It's an agape love that's being talked about here in the book of John in chapter 15. And I want to read that definition for you. It's love, affectionate regard, goodwill, benevolence. With reference to God's love, it is God's willful direction toward man. Willful direction. It involves God doing what he knows is best for man. Listen to this. And not necessarily what man desires. It is God knowing what's best for man, seeking out to do what is best for man, and not necessarily what man desires. I'm here to tell you this gospel that we have, this word of truth that we have is not necessarily what man desires. Do you understand that? It's not necessarily what man desires, but it's absolutely what man is in need of. It's not what they desire, but it's absolutely what they have need of. I'm here to tell you that it's going to take us with the love of God moving inside of us to cause us to be willing to lay our own reputations down. Because many times we won't share the love of God with people because we're worried about how they're going to look at us. We're worried about how they're going to think of us. Well, what will they think of me if I say that? How will they feel about me? If I say that, listen, I know I'm talking to each and every one of you because I've been there many, many times and I still find myself there many, many times. What will they think? What will they feel? Some of us, listen, don't get mad at me today. Examine your own heart. Some of us have been waiting for God to lead us for 25 years, 10 years, five years. I'm here to tell you, you're not waiting on God to lead you. You're waiting on yourself. God's waiting on you to get up and follow Him. Amen. Amen. He's waiting on you to surrender to the move that He's done, done inside of you. Amen. God has begun to stir some of y'all. He's begun to move in some of y'all's hearts to surrender to His will, to surrender to His call. And you're saying, I'm just waiting for the Lord to lead me. <laughs> but yet He's on the inside of you and He's been trying to stir He's tried to stir you already several times. Some of you today. He's tried to stir you several times to do what it is, to step into what he's called you to do. But he hasn't been able to stir you. And let me tell you what's going to happen when you don't move, when God begins to stir you. You're going to quench the Spirit of God. You're going to quench the Spirit of God in your heart. And in your life. And you're going to go around that mountain one more time. You're going to continue to find yourself just like the Hebrews. <coughs> around the mountain we go. Around the mountain we go. <coughs> and you'll constantly be brought into a place to where you cry out and say, Lord, deliver me. Lord, set me free. Just like the book of Judges. We see that in the book of Judges. The children of Israel constantly quenching the spirit of God. Then being brought back into a place of bondage, crying out once again, God deliver us. God deliver us. Listen, church, if God has stirred on your heart for something, if God has moved in your heart for something, you need to come to surrender in that area of your life. You need to ask God to allow the cross to crucify you. You need to ask God to allow His Spirit to bring you into submission to His will. 
Because it's not always an easy thing to do, church, to be brought into submission to what God wants to do in you and what he wants to do through you. But I'm here to tell you that it's necessary. I have encountered and met so many people that scream the cross, the cross, the cross, the cross. But yet, never to have the effects of the cross being carried out in their heart and in their life. The cross, the cross, the cross, the cross. It's all about the message of the cross. It's all about Jimmy Swaggart Ministries. It's all about this and all about that. But never seeing the effects of the cross happening in their heart and in their life. And I love Brother Swaggart, and I love SBN, and I believe wholeheartedly in the message of the cross. But my question to you today, is the cross affecting your heart? Is the cross affecting your life? Is the love of God being shed abroad in your hearts, like Romans chapter 5 says? Is the love of God being shed abroad? There was a time when preaching this gospel was about me. Lord, that I would preach a good message, that your people would see the a calling you have on my life, Lord, that I would be verified, that I would have verification on my ministry. Me, I, let them see me. But lately the Lord has been bringing me to a place to where I feel just like men like David Wilkerson. Lord, don't let them see me. Let me not desire anything, Lord. Oh, but Lord, let them see the love of God that you've placed inside of my heart. Let them see that come forth, Lord. Let your spirit, Lord, move upon their hearts and stir them, Lord, and cause them to desire a right walk with you, Lord. So I'm here to ask you tonight, this morning, is the cross that you claim affecting your heart and your life? Do you see the love of God moving? In Galatians chapter 5. And I'll start in verse 22. I want to look at the fruit of the Spirit. Now I want you to notice if we were to go back to John 15 where we started at. He continued to talk about fruit, 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 fruit. Is what he kept saying in John chapter 15. To bring forth fruit. To bring forth much fruit. To bring forth more fruit. But the only thing that he ever mentioned besides fruit is love. The only fruit that he mentioned there was love. See, it's my personal belief that all the other fruit of the Spirit hinge upon this one thing. The love of God being manifested in your heart and in your life. That if you don't have the true love of God flowing in you and through you, coming from your heart towards your brothers and sisters, towards humanity, then I say that if you don't have that, then there's very little chance that any other fruit are being manifested like they should. Oh, I'm not saying you can't act. I'm not saying... That you can't wear your WWJD bracelet and remember to be good and be nice to people. But I'm here to tell you that people know. Yes. People know when the true love of God is being shed abroad in your heart. People know when the love of God is emanating from you. I've, I've got brothers and sisters. I've got this one brother. His name's Ryan Keel. Some of you might be friends on Facebook. Maybe not. His name's Ryan Keel. He's from, uh, he lives around Texarkana. He, him, his wife, and their evangelists. They're two kids. Every weekend, they're out at the, the gay pride festivals. They're at the football games. They're all, their whole family preaching this gospel. And anytime I get around Sister Bridget, I can feel the love of God emanating from their very pores. It's not a, how you doing, brother? Give me a hug. I missed you. A faithless. No, it's something that's real. It's the love of God that will penetrate your skin and, and move into your heart and it will cause you to know this brother is real. This sister is real. This is the real deal. Yeah. I, I meet some preachers and some people that, oh, they're so kind and they're so sweet and they have these big old smiles and they won't say anything mean to anybody and they won't hurt anybody's feelings, but I can feel it from them that there's no love. 
There's no love of God. There's not a true love of God. See, because the love of God is a love that sacrifices oneself. It becomes not about how people think about me or how people feel about me. But it becomes about the truth of God's love being manifested and made known. Even when it comes to getting behind the pulpit. That you know what? I might say th some things that hurt your feelings. I might say some things that get you angry and make you mad. But is it truth? Does it need to be said? Examine yourself, church. How's your heart today? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Is that the love that's in your life? Is that the love that's taking place in your life? See, many times I've found in my walk that I've tried to move away from Christians that didn't look like they were doing so good. Because if I moved away from them, then I wouldn't have to deal with their problem. Oh, come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's easier to deal with ourselves and not have to deal with nobody else. We don't want other people to become a burden. On our life. We don't ever want other people to mess up our routine. To mess up what we want to do. The things and thoughts that we have. The desires we have for ourselves. We don't, we don't really like people messing those things up. But that's not the love of God. That's not the love of God, church. See, the love of God seeks out those that are messed up. The love of God seeks out a brother or sister who's in need. The love of God seeks out the lost. Jesus said it. He said, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. The love of God comes to seek that which is lost. The love of God comes to save that which is lost. The love of God comes to bear up a brother or sister's burdens. What's going on in your heart and in your life? Who is this Christianity about? Is it all about you? Is it all about you? What's happening? It's all about what I need, what I want, what I have. That my life wouldn't be messed up. That my time wouldn't be messed up. That my day wouldn't be messed up. Hurry up, preacher. I got to get out of here. Hurry up, worship team. My feet hurt. I got to go. I got places to be. I got things to do. I got somewhere to go. I got somebody to see. I got something that I want. It's me, me, me. It's all about I, I, I. Is the love of God shed abroad in your heart today? Is he having your, his way in your heart and in your life? We're almost done. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 I'm gonna, and verse 12. I'm going to look at a few more things. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Now we know that that's talking about first and foremost baptized into Christ Jesus. Like it tells us in Romans chapter 6 that we have been immersed into him. But it's also talking about being baptized into the church. Into the body of Christ. For by one spirit we are, all, are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles. Whether we be bond or free and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, 
Where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. I'm here to tell you something, church. This ain't about what pleases you. I'm here to tell you that this that God's called you into, it ain't about what makes your life easier. It ain't about what makes you feel good. It ain't, listen to this, it ain't even about your ministry. It's about His church. It's about His kingdom. It's about His people. It's about His desires. It's about what He wants. It's about what He wants to do. It's time that we as individuals get that set in our heart and in our mind and we begin to seek out not what we want, but what He wants. Not what we feel, but what He feels. Not what we desire, but what He desires. Well, Lord, that ain't really what I want to do. Well, it ain't about you. <laughs> if God has stirred in you and called you into something, you better say, Lord, it ain't my desire, but make it my desire. Amen. Amen. Change my desires to be your desires, Lord. Right. Take my heart away and put your heart in me, Lord. Amen. Let it not be about what I want, Lord, but let it be about what you want. Let it not be about me, Lord, but let it be about your body. Yes. See, the Lord desires. He seeks to move. He, he seeks to, to do a work inside of his people. But too many of us, and I've been there, and I find myself there time and time again. Too many of us get caught up in what we want. How we think it should be done. How we think it needs to be. And we all end up being one big eyeball. <laughs> and I know that's funny, but I didn't mean it to be because it's serious. It's true. Yes, it is true. I look around and I and I talk to other people in other ministries. I see I've been lately, the Lord has burdened me about the fivefold ministry. The Lord has burdened me about the gifts that He wants to use in His body. But unfortunately, it seems like a lot of the gifts are only worried about their gift. If you're an evangelist, well, I, I got to do this. It's all about what I'm doing in my evangelism. If you're a teacher, well, I got to teach this. It's all about what I'm teaching, what I'm doing. The pastor is over here worried about his thing. And, and then the apostles over here worried about, make sure everybody know I'm, a, I'm an apostle. Let me put apostle Bobby G. Brown before my name. But that ain't what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be the body of Christ moving and operating in the true love of God. Learning how to submit ourselves one to another, the word of God says. Not you submit to me, not me submit to you or submit to this one or submit to that one. But learning to submit ourselves one to another. Amen. Yes. See, the Lord moved me into another church under another pastor. I was used to doing things my own way. But doing how I want to do it. But see, I got to a place where I said, Lord, I don't care. I just want to be in your presence, Lord. Whatever it is, wherever I got to be, however you want to use me, I don't care. I want you, Lord. I need your presence, Lord. Like King David said, Lord, take the kingdom. Take it away. But, oh, Lord, take not your holy presence from me, Lord. Take not your spirit from me. I went to this other church and I said, Pastor, I'm coming over here to be a part of the congregation. I don't want to teach. I don't want to preach. I don't want to tell you how to do anything. I just want to be here and whatever you need from me is what I want to do. He said, Brother, I've been praying for help. He said, You're going to work. <laughs> and I've been ministering every Sunday. He's welcomed me with open arms. And we have disagreements. I don't see everything the way he sees it. But what I do see is I see the spirit of God moving and operating in his body the way that he desires. I said, Lord, let it not be about me. Fill me with your love, Lord. Let me love these people. Let me love them, Lord. <coughs> let me do whatever it is, Lord, that you want to do. <coughs> let me not quench your spirit, Lord. Let me not quench your presence. In this place, Lord, who is it about, church, in your life today? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, 
wherever the spelling. But now God has sent the mem members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. See, I've, I've, I've come to a place where at once I was good with being a lone ranger. I'm saying, Lord, please raise up the gifts in your body, Lord. Please use your people, Lord, the way that you want to use them. Bring them in the, into a, a maturation to where they look like you, to where they walk and talk like you, Lord, to, to where that you have the, the, uh, the leeway in their lives to operate and use them and work in them. Use your body, Lord. Use your people. Touch them, Lord. The love of Christ being shed abroad in this old black heart. The love of, of Christ being filling this old vile vessel. Nothing special. As a matter of fact, if you all could look at my life and look at my thoughts and look at my past, you probably wouldn't even allow me to talk to you. And probably some of you in here the same thing. But I just want to know you, Lord. I want a deeper walk with you, Lord. I want to love like you love, Lord. I want your heartbeat beating inside me. I've been praying, Lord. Take my heart, place it in your hand, and hold it. And allow my heart to beat for what your heart beats for. Allow my heart to move for what your heart moves for. Allow my heart to be your heart, Lord. Have your way in this vessel. See, when they started worshiping and praising, as soon as I asked prayer requests this morning for the body of Christ, the Lord began to move upon my heart. He said, this is it. This is what I want for my body. I want my love to be manifested in my body, in my people. And I began to weep and, and cry in his presence. And it's not about this building and not about any single individual, but it's about Christ. Amen. It's about his kingdom. And before he can do something corporately, he's going to have to do something individually Amen. with you. Yes. In your heart. Yes. In your life. In your relationship with him. Name much more of those members of the body which seem to be more feeble or necessary and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable. Upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. What does he say? He said, those that seem to be weak and feeble among us, I've put them there for a reason. Those that seem to be weak and in need, those that seem to be broken or, or seem to be lost or seem to be undone, stop scooting away from them and get next to them. If you're strong in the Lord, if the Lord's done something in you, stop moving away from those that are weak and broken and are all messed up and have all kinds of problems. Stop moving away from them. He put them there for a purpose. <clears throat> You think that he put you there for them and really in reality, he put them there for you. If you're strong in the Lord, it's not because of you, it's because of him. Amen. If you're strong in God's word and he's given you ability to teach and speak, to understand his word, it's not because you're anything special, it's because that's what he decided to do. Don't think yourself more highly than what you ought to. Don't think yourself more than what you ought to. You ain't nothing special. Nor am I. Nor is Matt. Nor is Brother Swagger or any other man or woman of God who's ever been used. There's nothing special about them except that's what God decided to do. It's what he decided to do. Nay, much more of those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think, he said, which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God had tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacketh. 
That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether, whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoiceth with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God hath chosen, hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles. Have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? I hope I'm, I'm, I'm not keeping you too long this morning, but I've got to get through this. See, we put a big focus as Pentecostal sect on speaking in tongues. But some of the meanest folk I ever met spoke in tongues, brother. <laughs> some of the, listen, I speak in tongues. I'm still right there worshiping the Lord speaking in tongues, and I believe in it. But some of the meanest folk I ever met are been some tongue talking Pentecostals with their skirts and their buns and their holiness and their righteousness. And I do this, and I'm this, and I'm that. And what are you? What's your denomination? What church do you go to? Why do you cut your hair? Why do you put makeup on? Why do you wear blue jeans? Why do you do this? What is this? What is that? What is all that? What is this nonsense? We put a focus on, well, you got to speak in tongues. Speak in tongues. The Apostle Paul said, all oh, that's good. He said, but let me show you a better way. Let me show you a better way. Covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. I'm worthless. I'm useless all by myself without nothing. I'm, I'm, I'm of no good to anybody. I'm a waste. And though I have the gifts of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so I can remove mountains and have not love, I'm nothing. Oh, I can quote to you a thousand scriptures and tell you the meaning of every little parable and everything in the Bible, but yet no one can feel the love of God in my heart and in my life because I'm useless. Because I got lifted up and thought that it was something about me. Me, me, me. If only you understood like I understand. If you only could learn like I learned. Could speak in tongues like me. But I got to, some people I meet, the first thing they want to tell you, man, the prophet said I got healing in my hands. Who cares? Do you got love in your heart? Yes. Amen. Do you got love, the love of God in your heart? Oh, the prophet said, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Who cares? What's in your heart? What's God doing on the inside of you? Don't tell me about gifts. Because the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. But let me see the love of God being shed abroad in your heart. Let me see the love of God being manifest in your life. Are you willing to lay it all down? Will you give it all up for the love of God? Examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. Is God having his way inside of you? So what you've got a gift? So what you can speak in tongues? I'm not putting none of those things down. I speak in tongues. I believe that God has gifted me to be used in his body, that he's placed a gift in me. But so what? Who cares? I also know who this vile man is and that I don't deserve any of it. But can I speak to an individual and they feel the love of God coming from my lips? Can I hug an individual and they'll know that it's the love of God and not an act? Who cares about all that other stuff? I want a more excellent way, church. Sister, I want the prostitute, whenever I talk to her, to know that there's a God in heaven. That her daddy might have beat her and might have molested her. Her uncles or so, so whoever might have raped her. But she's got a father in heaven that if she'll surrender her life, that he loves her. 
to the, to the molested child. I want them to know whenever I speak to them, I want them to be able to feel the love of God coming from God himself yeah. because his love is working in me and working through me. Oh, church, they need to know that he loves them and they need to feel it coming from our very being, from our very person. We need the love of God. <clears throat> church, you need the love of God in your heart and in your life, moving and operating, Amen. having his way inside of you. People are dying and going to hell. And all we worried about most of the time is who said something right? Who knows when the rapture is going to be at the right time? Should I speak in tongues or should I not speak in tongues? Should I do this or should I not do that? Am I saying this right? No, Lord, we need a more excellent way. Church, we need a more excellent way. We need the love of God moving. I need, oh, I want to see people saved. I want to see people set free. Oh, there's nothing greater. than a, a lost person, listen to me, coming and, 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 and finding out that there's a God who loves them and surrendering their heart. I don't. I would love to see the dead raised, and I would love to see a withered hand straightened, and I would love. But you know what? Despite all those things, if I can exchange all of those things a million times for one soul being saved, God knows my heart. I would in a heartbeat, because there's nothing greater. Brother God, than a, than a person who's on their way to hell, a heart that's blackened with sin. <clears throat> Maybe a person who's been beaten or raped or molested or, or all kinds of things. I saw my wife show me something here recently where a 10-year-old boy, boy got a hold of meth from his parents and he ate the whole bag and it killed him. Oh. Just the other day I seen a lady in Tampa who threw her little kid in the river. Four-year-old daughter threw her in the river. What's wrong? Churches on every corner. Churches all over the place. Everywhere you look, there's a church. Church here, a church there, a church here, a church there. I thought about it the other day. The Lord was moving in me, and I just came to remembrance. You know, I'm, I'm 37 years old, and I can count on probably one and a half hands of how many times outside of these walls that I've had somebody walk up to me and share the gospel with me. Lord, help us. What an indictment on the church that we don't have the love of God moving and operating in us to a point that we would care less about our reputation and care more about those that are going to hell. God, help us. God, help us. What's our problem? What's wrong with us? What's our problem? Church, whatever. There's probably 30 churches right here in between here and Morgan City. Mm -hmm. How many times? Listen, I want you to think about yourself. How many times has someone walked up to you and shared the gospel with you outside of these four walls? How many times? And, and listen, before you start getting too hard on the rest of the church, how many times have you Walked up to somebody and shared the gospel with them. Not even somebody you didn't know, but those that you love. Oh, you're condemning us, preacher. No, I'm not. <clears throat> I'm not condemning you. I'm telling you, this can't be carried out unless you surrender your heart and life totally, all the way into the cross of Christ and allow the Spirit of God to move and operate and have His way in you. And I'll tell you what it took for me. It took me coming to a place first of realization I wasn't there. Lord, I'm not there. My relationship with you is not right. Things are not like they should be, Lord. Listen, church, the Lord wants to do a work in his body. That's right. He wants to do a work in his people. He said, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, I'm almost done. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profited me nothing. I can do all these things. I can be a, listen, there are people that are a part of all these things. They do all of these things. But there's no love of God in it. Some people do it because they want to be noticed. Some people do it just because they know that that's what they're supposed to be doing. I'm a Christian. This is what I'm supposed to be doing, so I'm going to do it. And thank God for that. 
But I don't want to just do something because I know I'm supposed to be done it. I want to be like the Apostle Paul when he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, Woe is me if I preach not this gospel. Woe is me. I want to be like Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, I wasn't going to talk about it. I wasn't going to say anything, but it was like a fire shut up in my bones. And it had to come out. I had to let it out. That's what I want. Our God is a consuming fire. He wants to consume your life. He wants to consume your heart. He wants to consume your lips. Is he consuming you? Or are you just glad right now that the saints haven't started yet? Oh, amen. Yeah. Our God's a consuming fire. His concern ain't about what makes you happy in life. His concern about is his kingdom. Amen. You ask the apostle Paul when you see him if he was happy with the prison cell. You ask Peter if he was happy about being crucified upside down. You ask John if he was happy about boiling oil around his skin and exiled to, a, to an island. Well, God just wants you to be happy. No, God is not concerned so much with your happiness as he is with your surrender. Oh, come on now. You know the same God I know, huh? Talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm talking about the God of Daniel. I'm talking about the same, listen to me now, the same God that as Stephen was getting stoned. And this is what always catches me. The word of God says they gnashed him with their teeth. Stephen was willing to get stoned and gnashed with. They bit him. They chewed on him like he was a piece of meat. Paul stood there and watched it. And the love of God was shed abroad in Stephen's heart. And he looked up to the heavens and he saw the Son of Man standing. The Word of God said. Standing, not seated. I can imagine that Jesus was peering over thinking, well done, my good and faithful servant. And what flowed from Stephen's heart? Forgive them. Lay this not at their charge. Do you have that? Do you have that? Well, this ain't then. No, but our God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you ain't moving forward, it's because you're backslidden. If you're not moving forward with your God, it's because, oh, preacher, don't say that. That's mean. I'm just being honest. I'm not here for another invitation. I'm here to tell the truth. If you're not moving forward with God, God didn't stop. He's still moving. So I'm here to provoke you today. To cause you to, today to examine your heart. Examine yourself. Whether you be in the faith. He said, love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. It doth not behave itself unseemly or seeks out her own. It is not easily provoked. It thinks no evil. It rejoices in iniquity. It rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. It beareth all things. It believeth all things. And let me just clarify that real quick, what he's talking about, because that don't mean he believes. We don't believe any stupid thing any preacher says. What it says is, and this is all talking about dealing with the body and dealing with brothers and sisters. See, I've had brothers and sisters come to me with certain things before, and my mind was saying, oh, that's a lie. But the Lord of God, the Lord is saying, when the love of God is moving and operating in your heart, you'll desire to believe what it is your sister or brother is telling you that may be the cause of their situation, whether it is or not. There will be a desire to believe them, a desire, because you know what? It's whenever we start looking at our brothers and sisters in the wrong light, in the wrong manner, that we're going to start to treat them the wrong way. And what does the Word of God say about those that despitefully use you? Love them. Pray for them. Help us, Lord. I know what so-and-so did to me. Oh, I still love them, but I ain't, I ain't forgot about it. Help us, Lord. 
Love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I am known. Now abideth faith, hope, and charity, faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest thing that you can have, church, is the love of God shed abroad in your heart. Amen. The greatest thing that you can have, church, is God's love, not just for you, but in you, moving and operating and having his way. As I ask the, singers and the, music, uh, the, the singer and the musician to come back up, to sing whatever it is that they feel the Lord has laid on their heart. I'm going to go to one last verse that I have as they come up and get ready. I'm here to tell you that God hasn't called you to maybe express this type of love. He hasn't been, and listen to this, He hasn't called you to do it in and of yourself either. There was a time in my life, brother, I didn't care about nobody care less. Oh yeah, I mean I didn't like to see people die and stuff like that. That would bother me. But I lived my life according to what I wanted. What I desired. I would even put my own family off to the side to get what I want. I look back now at the time and the years like Brother Swagger sings that song, Wasted Years. Oh, so many wasted years. Oh, thank Lord how many times did I leave my children at home so I can go and get what I wanted? Taking time from their life. See, because church, every breath that you take is one less that you have. Every second that rolls off of that clock is one second closer that you are to death if the Lord doesn't come. That's the reality of this situation. I'm here to tell you that this is no joke. This is no joke, church. We need the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. If you're going to see your family saved, you need the love of God shed abroad in your hearts. They've got to be able to see that there's something different in you. They've got to be able to see that there's something different about you. Not just that you have a bunch of knowledge, because they can't understand the knowledge that you got. It's spiritual. But they need to see when you talk that there's a hunger and a desperation. I remember when I used to try to tell my mom about the message of the cross. I couldn't help but get passionate and cry because I knew I had the truth and I wanted to give it to her. And there was just a hunger and a desire, a love that filled me. Now I'm going to read this last little bit of verses in John chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. And as I do, stand with me today. I would ask that you examine your heart. I would ask that you examine your heart and your relationship with your God. Don't examine your brother or sister or whoever else, but examine your heart, your walk with God, your relationship. Allow the Spirit of God to open the eyes of your heart. Jesus said, Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You shall seek me, and as I said unto you, the Jews, unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say unto you, a new commandment. I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Listen to this, church. He said this, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, not that you speak in tongues and not that you prophesy and not that you have knowledge of the word of God. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love one to another. 